Hey guys, I'm really excited that we have Tyler Bryant on the show today. I've been a fan of Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown for a while, so it was really cool to be able to hear the new album before it's out and sit down and pick his brain about the songs on it. And we're also going to delve into his backstory of how he came to be so successful and tour with ACDC and Guns N' Roses. Plus, he opens up about his anxiety. All this and more coming right up. Thank you for doing this i'm a big fan i love your music so this is really cool it's really cool that you have a new album and i get to hear it before everybody else i feel special about that so uh, tell me about it's called nice. uh shake the roots yeah it's shake the roots it's um it's an album produced and recorded by us and um we're releasing it on our new record label rattle shake records so it's a first independent release for the band and uh, i'm really proud of the record to me it's 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 just it it seemed like the the next step in our process as a band you know yeah so explain this because um you started investing in your own recording equipment so that you could prepare for this so that you wouldn't need to use the record labels in the studios right yeah well i mean it's been something i've been doing over the last like handful of years you know i mean i was um I was pretty much a staff songwriter for Sony ATV for eight years. And I realized then that I would never, I would never make any money if I was constantly hiring people to make my demos for me. And Caleb Graham and I, we would constantly get together through the years and we would write and record songs. And there've been tons of songs that we've recorded on our own that have ended up in TV shows and commercials, and they've never even been on records. And we were going, man, like a lot of these recordings that we're not even putting out are actually paying the bills for us. And so then we'd go make a record, you spend all your money and you'd end up owing a record label, a bunch of money. And it's like, why don't we do it like the way that we've just been doing it. And so once I kind of embraced that rather than, and I think also there's a, there's a certain amount of um, insecurity that every artist has and and you know thinking that someone is going to bring something to the table you know like some some producer is going to make something and i think one thing that i've learned is producers don't make records artists make records producers help facilitate records you know i mean sure there's like you get the guys that are replaying the band stuff which we've had i've had a, i've had a producer literally replay my guitar parts when after i left the studio and guess what we didn't put that record out you know what I mean? <laughs> so Wait, he literally like he redid your guitar parts because you're pretty damn good guitarist. So like he thought he was better than you or I don't understand. I don't know if it's a better thing. It's it's maybe he was hearing it differently than I was hearing it. And so and that's that's the thing. It's it's and that's not to say that he was wrong. He was producing the record and we yeah. heard him produce the record. And but also. He that, wanted like a specific sound and you weren't giving whatever that sound was or. Yeah, basically, he wanted a shitty sound. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if he just has a different vision, uh, yeah, I get, I, I get that. That's interesting because you know, I listen to your obviously, I've heard your old catalog, and then I hear this, and I don't hear like any sort of drop off in production at all. I mean, it sounds top notch to me. Oh, thanks, man. Well, you, you know, I've, I've, um, I've, I've really worked hard at at acquiring the tools I need to make sure that corners aren't being cut you know and also the record was mixed brilliantly mastered brilliantly uh i i i play it next to my favorite shakedown records and i i think it it hangs in there and i play i play it against you know other records that i like and i you know it's it's just exciting to me but i mean that's another thing that i think a lot of people get and especially producers and engineers that i've worked with no not all of them i mean we've worked with i don't want to sound negative against i mean we worked with some of the best people in the business like vance powell is like one of the best roger allen nichols one of the best joel hamilton like these people i've i've literally i keep a notebook and i write down things that i learned from working with these people because they're they're amazing hmm. and um, what have you learned can you share any of that stuff any any pointers for other musicians well i mean the thing one of the things that i love about vance powell working with him is he's like he's never going to sacrifice the moment to get a sound like there's a song on our first record wild child called poor boy's dream 
we were in the kitchen of his studio at that time working up the song and the next thing i know he's got two or three mics probably three mics tops in front of us caleb was like hitting a coffee pot with a spoon that's on the record like he's not going to wow miss anything and i think that sense of like capturing the moment is one thing i picked up from him as well as a bunch of other technical stuff that we don't want to bore anyone with (laughs) (laughs) you know like on the snare he had the transient designer you know right there's got to be like levels and all those kinds of things because like i said i mean this sounds just as good as all the other records if not better and i think part of that too is just the, the technology has changed right like in the 80s and 70s you couldn't do this shit in your basement. I mean, it would not sound the same, but now with Pro Tools and all this stuff, all the technology, everybody's able to produce really high quality sounding records, I think. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's crazy. I mean, and, and this this record was tracked completely analog as well. Like it's- Really? Yeah, I mean, it was tracked into digital, but it was all analog on the front end. You know, I mean, I've got like tons of preamps from the 50s and 60s and, you know, Neebs and- you know, uh, whatever, all the, all the nerdy stuff. Yeah. You know, but there's one thing that I remember from working with another incredible engineer. And I, I always refer to him as the Yoda of Berry Hill, Tennessee, um, Richard Dodd, who like Mary Jane's last dance was his rough mix that he sent Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers home with. Oh, I love that song. And I remember calling him when I was 17 and I, I recorded this song um, that I wanted him to master And I asked him, I said, what's the best microphone I can get to sing into? And, you know, this really like broad question. And and he said, the best microphone is the one that works when you need it to. And that's one thing that I think um, I've found frustrating in certain recording experiences I've been involved in is if you're waiting on an engineer, if you're waiting on the producer and you're ready to go as the artist, then you're, you're potentially missing that wave of inspiration or creativity so like with my spot i've got it set up where the drums are always going sometimes there's even a second drum kit mic'd up if we need a different sound there's multiple different vocal options for we want to go with like a vintage gritty vocal sound or we want like a hi-fi whatever um multiple bass options lord knows there's multiple guitar options and just having everything to where it's on and ready if someone sits down and that's like there are certain songs on this record a um, couple of them were written and recorded in like an hour, you know, because it's everything's going. And and this is another thing that I've realized with with our band. I mean, we're 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 like a blues rock band. We like grungy things that are not polished and a little bit rough around the edges. And um, so there's like there's a song called Tennessee that we wrote, and and it's this the idea of demoing. I think gets gets into a lot of artists heads where it's like you need to record the song a bunch of times and and refine it and and what i found with our band is the more we refine stuff and refine stuff the kind of the lamer it gets a lot of times you start mm-hmm. losing that excitement and that like initial feeling um and so this is we we kind of joke about this record like it's the record that we never started because it each song started out as a hang with the band and then we would just be hanging out and then someone would be jamming or, and then there'd be a recording and it was like, Oh, cool. Is it a demo? Is it a master? We don't know. And then before you know it, we've got way more songs than we need way more recordings than we need. And you just, we picked our favorite ones. Yeah. I love this kind of music. I agree. And I think, this stuff, this this album is just like a precursor to you playing it live, right? I feel like it's the, when I listen to this album, I feel like these songs are designed to hear live. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and they're and that's sort of the thing too. Is there's we we've, we've made we've we've released songs in the past that we just don't play. You know, it's like it sounds really cool in the studio and stuff, but it's there's it doesn't really sound like us. And then once we try to do it, it's like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So. Wow. That's really cool. So it sounds like besides just, I mean, you're doing so many things because you write the songs, you sing, you play guitar, and now you're you're doing all the production and all this stuff. I mean, you're really taking a lot on with this project. Like you right? Well, yeah, totally. And I mean, my, you know, everyone in everyone in the band is, you know, they work so hard and not only not only do, are we doing all of that, but we're also hiring 
all of the people that are working the record ourselves, we're, we are the record label at this point, you know? So we're doing everything from filming music videos, editing music videos, getting all the graphics together. We are our own machine at this point. And that's solely to have ownership of our music. Cause we've never had complete ownership of our art before. Mm -hmm. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And I, and I'm, I know that, I know that it can work. I know that we're probably going to make a handful of missteps along the way because it's a new endeavor for us. But, you know, we won't hit the ball if we don't swing for it. Yeah, you have such an amazing philosophy. I mean, your story is so inspiring. Like, tell me if I have this right. Like, your first guitar, age six, then you sell, or your first electric guitar is age 11. You sell your dirt bike to get that. Then at thir by, by 13, you're already playing shows with Roosevelt Twitty, like a blues guy. And mm. then you start writing songs and then your first band at 15 and then already by 15, 16, you're winning awards. Like, have you always been this driven to do, to do uh, this, this thing? Like, I mean, it's just, this always been in your blood since it, since you picked up that first guitar. I think um, I've always been driven. Um, and I, I, I will say that that, that comes directly from my parents. You know, my, I come from a very like humble blue collar, hardworking family, you know, we weren't poor, but we weren't rich. You know what I mean? And uh, my dad always worked two jobs and my mom always worked two jobs. And I never heard either of them complain about it. And and my dad always stressed to me that work ethic was one of the most important things in life. And this is one of the things that I've always loved. So I've, I've always worked really hard at it. Um, you know, not to the point of not loving it. That's something that I really protect. Hmm. Yeah, it's just interesting because I mean, I think of myself as a teenager and I used to work with teenagers and most of them don't know what the hell they want to do. And at 17, I mean, tell tell my audience the story. This is so cool. Like at 17, you move to Nashville and, and you tell your parents and like you, you put on like a presentation explaining like your plan and stuff. I mean, this is so mature, like beyond your years. Dude, I don't know. I mean, I just I had to make music and I really I, I lived in a small town. OK, so Honey Grove, Texas. I think the population sign says 1746, which is, there's no way it's, it's a tiny little town. There was not, no one I could play the type of music every day that I wanted to play. You know, I couldn't play with someone every day. And, um, and I wanted, I didn't want to play. I, I had a great group of like older friends who were talented blues musicians and stuff, but I was, I was watching videos of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers when they were young and, the stones and the black crows and it's like it it seemed like it was a band it was this group of dudes that were rolling around making their music and and i and i really wanted to have that in my own life and no one that i went to school with was into the type of music that i was into and i felt hmm. like an outcast and i came to nashville with um these guys i was playing with in this blues band and i remember meeting uh i met this guy named jaron from now the band's cadillac three um, and they're they're doing killer. And uh, he had a band called American Bang at the time. And I remember thinking, I could hang out with this guy. He's like me, you know, and being really inspired by the thought that there was a place where there were more people that were into the same thing that I am. Not even thinking like it's country, country music city, which I love. I love classic country music as well. So um, I went back to Nashville. I mean, I went back to Honey Grove, Texas and immediately was like, I'm moving to Nashville and started making plans and tried to figure out if I could finish high school or if I wasn't going to be able to finish high school. And uh, I kind of had to work that out because there was no way I'd missed the mark to graduate early. And so I dro ended up dropping out of high school and kind of quietly enrolling into this online program to get the last credits that I needed, but I never changed my address legally. So the day before graduation my senior year i went and enrolled in high school and i had all my credits and graduated so it worked i ended up getting yeah. otherwise my mom would have cried every day for the rest of her life and uh i got to spend my whole senior year moving to nashville i'd saved up money from playing in my blues band and uh i told my parents i wasn't going to ask them for money i had you know bmi had helped me out giving me a like a, a small advance to to live on which i had to pay back you know and uh, I, I just started trying to write songs and put a band together and still what i'm now i'm just trying to write songs and keep a band together you know yeah well it's cool too <laughs> how did you even like um 
open because you were opening for big bands even before you moved to Nashville, right? Like, because isn't that part of the story that um, you failed band class because you were doing these gigs and one of them was like Paul Simon or so. How did you get a, a gig opening for Paul Simon from that small little town? Man, you know what? I think, um, well, it, it all kind of started with, I used to call the House of Blues box office nonstop, say, you know, like Dickie Betts is coming. Can I, can I open for Dickie Betts? And they'd be like, you can't call us anymore. You know, we don't book the shows. And finally, <laughs> finally someone at the box office put me like, realized that I was just, I was probably just annoying them to no end. So they put me in touch with someone who worked at Live Nation or whatever it was. And they, the guy called me and said, what do you want? And put me on a show. The first one was with Dickie Betts. And then it was like, call the Dallas Morning News. Hey, I'm my band's doing a show. You need to come out. You need to film it. This is a big deal. I'm from a small town. Kids like me don't get this kind of opportunity. And I think always like trying to appreciate, you know, they always say like everyone's everyone's the star of their own movie. And I think especially as a kid, I felt like that. I was like, this is my story. I'm writing my story. And I wanted I wanted to share that. And, um, you know, the Dallas Morning News ended up doing this story on that show from me, like calling the box office to getting a gig and. That's so ballsy, though, to, to as a kid to call the news and be like, you guys should do a story on me. Like, that's it's real. I love it, though. It's and especially the even call the, calling the House of Blues so many times like you just like really wanted it. But you didn't just talk about it. You took action. Well, it's, like pretty cool. I, I, I had a ton of people, too, that were encouraging me, you know, like if you want to mm -hmm. do it, man, my dad always told me that he's like, if you want to do it, you need to do it. You know, if you're going to mm -hmm. if you're going to try to be be the best at it and you need to try to be the best at it you know it's sort yeah. of yeah but did and, your dad uh, whose idea was it to, to call the the news and the in the house of blues was that just your own idea it was definitely my dad's idea to call the uh call the news people because he thought i mean he i think he could see the story of it too hmm. even more than i could but um but that ended up leading to more gigs to where then i would get because i the band the band showed up on time stayed out of the way played you know, to the best of our abilities that we could. And we started getting called, called back. And so then it ended up being like, mm -hmm. want to come open for BB King. Do you want to come? So I played a bunch of these shows at the house of blues and that led to making connections. It meant it led to, uh, you know, I ended up meeting this guy, Donnie Nelson, who was the general manager of the Dallas Mavericks. And he wanted to start a uh, record label called heroes music that was focused on kids like me who didn't have a lot of, lot of uh, money or you know uh, the ability to make records and anything like that and kind of used me as a guinea pig so basically they loaned me like ten thousand dollars to make a record which i paid back selling records out of the back of my truck wow you know so it was it was like i, I definitely had people helping me but uh, but also um i had a lot of a lot of drive which i i do yeah you, you asked for that help. I mean, you went out and got that help, but yeah, of course you, you needed other people to do it. You couldn't do it alone. No, I couldn't, I couldn't do it alone, but I, I had, uh, you know, great, great people, um, helping me out, but also that's part of, that's part of doing anything in this business is not trying to do everything yourself. And which I say this as we're like, we recorded it. We engineered it. We're putting it out. You know? <laughs> True. Yeah. You know, but, but that's the same, the thing, thing with, with Rattleshake records is like, while we are doing so much ourselves, we like we've gone out and been cherry picking exactly who we're hiring to, you know, like there's a reason we're talking. It's because we hired a publicist who set it up, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that's the same thing you get at a label. So we're going, what, did, what does the label have? What do we need? What's important mm -hmm. to us? Where is it important for us to spend our money? And also another thing is I feel like a lot of times if you're if you're at a record label, the people who are working there don't get to choose exactly who they're working with, you know? So like if I'm, if I'm, you know, Joe Diddley sitting at a desk and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, you got to work for this band. And I listen to it and I go, this band sucks. I don't want to work with this band. Right. You know? But we can at least make sure we're hiring people that believe in what we're doing. Yeah. Cause what was, tell me the story about the deal. You, you had to deal with Republic records, which, was that where Aria, uh, what was her name? Ariana Grande was on that record? Or what was the story with that? Oh, she wasn't on our record, but we, we were certainly on, the, you know, we were on the same record label. But uh, yeah, no, that was, it was a, it was a cool, um, I think sometimes 
sometimes the narrative gets skewed that we're like really bitter about that experience. And and I, I don't feel any bitterness at all. It's just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. Um, our friend John Barbados uh, started a, a label with Republic Records, one of the largest record companies in the world, if not the largest record company. And uh, they they signed the shakedown. We made a record called The Wayside and only half of the record came out. And there were there were plans to put out the back half, but uh, it, it never came to be. And I and I think I I did feel pretty bitter about it for a time, but also it's like they didn't put it out because we didn't have like a raging hit. You know, and for us, the the record was successful. But to them, especially when you're comparing it to, like Ariana Grande or something like that, it, right? It, That's what their expectations were. Yeah. So we were during that time, we were literally out on a world tour with ACDC playing stadiums every night, and we can't get the record label to put out our music, and it's like, or set up anything because like hmm. all of a sudden we're getting zero attention, zero help. You know, and, and that's a that's a tough place to be because and I think it happens to bands time after time. You know, you put something out, there's high hopes for it, but these labels, they have so many artists that they're they would be foolish not to put their energy and attention and manpower behind what's work not not put it behind what's working, you know. So it's another reason we're here. Yeah. Is that because I know like um, you had signed with a booking agent, the creative artist agency, because that's how that is not how you got a lot of these shows like ACDC and, and all that stuff is, is because of the booking agent. Are you still with that uh, booking agent or a different one now? I think how we got a lot of these shows is relationships because we were with the creative artist agency with an agent named John Huey for a long time. And uh, I met him. I met him when I was 17, like before I moved to Nashville, he and I shook hands and I said, you're going to be my booking agent. He said, I'm going to be your booking agent. And that was our, that was our contract. It's the only contract I ever had. Hmm. And he was our booking agent until, you know, he had some stuff go on with his family. Um, he lost a son and um, he started getting, you know, just, it was harder to get in touch with him. And it wasn't that he was, it was just he had he had life going on, you know, and we had life going on in a, in a different way where it was like we need to we need to work and we weren't getting a ton of uh, shows on the books. And I remember calling him and saying, I think we need to uh, we need to find a different agent. And he was like, yeah, I completely understand. My head's just in a different place right now because he was going through a very personal family thing. And uh, I remember. uh you know, Caleb, Caleb and I went to his son's funeral and he hugged me and told me how much that meant to him. And we we're at a different booking agency and they got us on this acoustic tour with Billy Gibbons. And uh, I'm sitting in the back of our band band rolling down the highway and I get a call from John Huey, our old booking agent, going, is it OK if I go to bat for you guys? I want to get you the world tour with ACDC. And so wow. he's, he's going to put his name on the line for an artist that he doesn't even represent. So that's that's why I say relationships are everything, showing up on time, doing your best, being kind to people, treating people with respect. And I think that's really a, a big part of the reason we've had so many opportunities is because we show up to each opportunity going, how cool is this that we get to do this and like try to have a positive attitude and just be, a, a nice person <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i mean it's like you're like a recipe for like how to run a good business like which is not what you would expect people think rock and roll is like drugs and partying and alcohol and booze all, like i don't hear any of that stuff from you uh, do you guys even have like a beer ever occasionally or like <laughs> yeah dude <laughs> we love to we, we'd love to have a good time you know we okay. I mean, it's uh you know, but I also I do think that a lot of those old like rock and roll stereotypes we've seen countless time and time time and time again how it ends and how it like and also it just sucks to go hear a band and they're too they're too bombed to play and I think we just we have so much respect for putting on a great show and and also just from grinding it out year after year in a van you know it's like we're grateful when people come to see us and so we want to make sure we give them the best show and then then we'll hang out and party all night long, you know? 
all right just yeah it just seems like you're so focused like you know it's almost like you don't have time for that like you're just too busy to do all this other stuff no we love we love having a good time um but yeah we but you know it's it's the the music comes first and the show comes first and then you absolutely know. well here let's break down the uh the new album so uh just so people we can kind of give people a little bit of a tea. I can't, I don't think I can play any music. I don't want to, I don't know how the rules with that are, but we'll just talk about it. And then okay. uh, when does that, what is the release date? I don't know if I got a release date for the September, public. I mean, it's out September to me 9th. now, but what yeah. is it? September 9th. September 9th. Okay. So September 9th. So first song is bare bones. Is that one out yet or no? No, it's not. The only is song there no that's singles out, right out? Now, Yeah. Ain't none watered down is out. And then uh, ghost rider comes out on the second. Oh, I love that song. That one's got like kind of a different guitar sound. It's it's more modern. Yeah. Um, talk about the lyric for that. Are you keeping me from going down forever, forever till the road runs out? Like, what what is that about? Um, well, it's funny because it I wrote that with Graham, um, the guitarist in the Shakedown, and I think he was kind of I think his brother was in this really um, crazy motorcycle accident in Los Angeles where someone's couch fell out of the back of their truck. And he hit the couch and flew off his bike and landed like a million miles away from the bike and was completely fine. And so I think Graham was thinking about it from like this sort of guardian angel perspective. But I think about it totally different. I think about that that lyric as, you know, we've been talking about drive and ambition and focus and all that stuff. And I that's what I think about with ghostwriters. It's like that voice in your head that's telling you to keep going, you know, even whenever everything around you is telling you to stop or that you're gonna fail and and so it's that's one thing i love about songs is people can interpret them completely different so well that's interesting you you actually do have a voice that because i mean i have that voice but i thought i was like for someone like you is open for acdc and guns and roses like at that point i think that would think that you're you know you're you're all in you're so there's still a voice that sometimes sometimes tells you to quit or you think have thoughts of leaving it or uh, I don't have thoughts of leaving it, um, but there's there's um, there's certainly always that that insecure voice that's like gonna try to make you believe it rather than hmm. believing the moment you're in. You know, there's and I think that's something that you know I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because it's it's what drives you to be better. But um, I I have to I struggle quieting that voice personally. Like I've 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 had so much anxiety and like for a while there, like full on like panic disorder, um, just being like, I'm going to, I'm going to get on stage and forget all the words. I'm going to, I'm going to get up there and forget how to play. I'm going to, and like just getting in your head and like spiraling out. And there's, there's really no explanation for it. It just, and that's, that's just the thing with like anxiety and that kind of stuff is sometimes it's almost impossible to pinpoint where it's coming from or why it's even there. And, uh, you know, but it, it helps to, to write positive things that are like, okay, I, I believe this. Wait, do I believe this? Yes, I believe this, you know? And I, so how I, do you deal with that when you have that panic? I mean, was this fully like diagnosed? Like you have to take medication or what? Like, just, yeah, just... no, I, um, there for, there for a while, I, I always, I, so I, I ended up going, I reached a point where Caleb, the drummer pulled me aside and was like, dude, you got to go see a doctor, man. Like you, you can't, keep doing this to yourself because i would get like physically sick before every show and then like not want to see people or like just it, it it wasn't a good a good thing so i ended up going to a doctor and having like a pretty much a full-on like breakdown and it's funny because then the doctor asked me to sign a copy of our first record she had <laughs> in her car and i was like oh my god the world is against me you know and um I got I got prescribed medication which I didn't want to take because I I um I've had family members who've you know gotten on this particular medication and kind of it it didn't help it it sort of zombified them and uh, yeah. I know that you know sometimes people really do need medication and I and I did and I once I found the right medication I took it for a while and then I st and I started almost finding power in not taking it going I'm okay and and trying to do other things that were that were grounding for myself and then it and then it became I'm not going to take the medication I'm going to put it in my pocket and I'll know it's there if I need it and um and then it became 
I'm not going to put it in my pocket. I'm going to leave it in my backpack. And I'll know it's in my backpack. If I need it, I can have the guitar tech go get it or something. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, I don't have it. So, and it, I don't know. It's, I don't know. Everybody's, everybody's experience is totally different. And I have a lot of sympathy for people going through it. And there's, a, you know, I think talking to people is good. Talking about it's good. There's too many people acting like it's not a, not a real thing, you know? No, it's definitely real. I just had um, Doug Pinnock from, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the band King's oh, X. I love King's X, man. Doug yeah, dude. He was telling me about that. He had the same thing. He had panic disorder and he said it's it's real. And he said his theory is like the panic is try is bringing something to the surface, like something that you need to deal with. So I, I don't know. I, that's an interesting I, I, I 100 theory. 100% agree with that, man. It's it. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe you've kind of dealt with that and now you've moved on from it. Yeah, totally. Yeah could always resurface and then you got to deal with something else. So that's just life. It goes up and down and part of life, man. I think, and it's, it's also, I mean, the, the thing that I, that I'm grateful for about it is like now that whenever I have, I, I've had a few people close to me in the last few years who've, who've gone through a similar thing because it's when it was happening to me for like, when it first started, I was canceling everything, you know, staying in bed, not wanting to not being productive at all. Like, you know, and I, and I, changed i changed a lot of stuff i went like a year without even drinking coffee dude i mean i drink tons of coffee wow so i was i was like really like what's going on what did i break my brain you know and and i never understood it whenever people talked about it until it happened to me and now it's been interesting to have friends around me who've dealt with a similar thing and getting to to be like this is not something that's forever and it's also not something that you're alone in you know mm-hmm so, and, and there, that's another thing that I'm really grateful for is like on our truth and lies record, that was like at the height of when I was going through that mentally. Um, and there are certain songs and they're like panic button or shape I'm in. And I've had so many people come up to me being like, that's how I felt too. I feel like that. And, and I think that's cool that music sort of can provide that sense of like, I'm heard. That's, that's where I am too, you know? No, absolutely. Because it's funny, I listen to your, some of your music. And I mean, there's good music, obviously, out there that I, I can hear music that's good, and it sounds good. But but your music, for some reason, it actually speaks to me like I feel like the emotion, I feel like you're expressing your emotions through the guitar and through your voice, like I can like feel it. It's really it's weird. It's a, so is that cathartic for you to write these songs and play these songs? A hundred percent, man. I mean, like part of the thing that I get most excited about is finishing a song, turning the lights down, turning the music up and just listening to it and, you know, dancing or sitting there and like feeling how it emotionally hits and hoping that it will hit someone else that way too, you know? Mm -hmm. Like there's a song on the new record called Hard Learned. And I remember just being, so, you know, my friend Eleanor um, played uh, th these beautiful strings on it. And which is, a you know, that's a sort of a, a, something out of left field for the shakedown we don't have a violinist in our band but the song felt like i thought it would be really cool to have this really grungy blues song with these personal lyrics and then have this emotional this so emotive instrument instrument come in and i remember just sitting there going this makes me feel so happy you know and and uh i can't i can't wait for people to hear that song yeah, I love the, it's like a slower, darker song. And the lyric, uh, is it, what does it say? Every scar where you can best believe I earned, say a prayer for me because the devil don't seem concerned. Yeah, That's yeah. awesome. It's super hopeful, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is that about? Is that, what is that speaking of? Dude, I mean, for me, it's just like, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know your how your personality is, but like someone can tell me not to do something a million times. And almost if they tell me, if they tell me a million and one, I'm going to do it. You know, <laughs> and it's sort of like, that's just been how I've, how I've been wired since I was a kid. And uh, just kind of verbalizing that, you know, it's everything I know has been hard learned, you know, um, that was, that was a fun one because we, we kind of were coming to a close on this album and, you know, we were already almost completely mixed and i and i just felt like every time i listened to it there wasn't a a down moment there wasn't a moment where the uh, the listener could catch their breath and uh, i started just singing picked up a guitar and just started singing and that's what came out 
And uh, I went and showed it to my wife and she she had a couple of of great lines that she contributed to that as well. So hmm. that's uh, really cool. Yeah. yeah, I like also the song um, Shackles. That's a cool song. It's got some crazy guitar solos. I mean, there's the guitar work on this is obviously phenomenal, the whole record, but that one, especially the solos. But it's funny. I used to have a friend. He worked for a corporate bank and he used to joke like every time he's going to work, he's like, I'm putting the shackles on. Yeah. So like, well, what does it mean? What did, what did you mean when you wrote it? And you know, that's, that's the only song on the record. That's not a new song. That one wasn't like, really? yeah. So that song was written probably when I was 20, 21, something, you know, 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, I think that, that was just sort of a making up a story of some ominous creature showing up in your life. You know, I hear shackles coming through the door. Uh oh, what is? Mm. It? I don't even know. I don't even know what it is. I don't have. I don't have any like profound uh, explanation for that one. That one was just. It's, <laughs> it's good though. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I have. And then, and with that, with that song, that was one that we've been playing live for years, and we never had a recording of it that sounded mm. as exciting as how it does live. So we just played it down live. You know. No, oh, very cool. And then the songs. Um, the two of my favorites too, the, the kind of more faster aggressive songs are Off the Rails and Midnight Oil. Could you see those? Now, to me, those both sound like something that you'd see in a movie or a TV, like Midnight Oil. I could see like somebody burning a big, you know, blowing something up and playing that song or like, you know, yeah. maybe, you know Off the Rails and maybe like a TV show montage or even played during football. Are yeah. those two that you would try to get placement for? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I would love, I would love to get a, you know, I mean, that's I feel like a lot of people uh, learned about the shakedown. We had a song uh, in Sons of Anarchy, and it's one of our most like if we go and look at any like metrics or anything, which is one of the most rock and roll things you can do. <laughs> you know, but like the, our song House on Fire was in Sons of Anarchy, and it's one of the most Shazam songs. And because oh. of that, and it was this epic like shootout car chase scene. And the song was, I feel like off the rails would be perfect for some, some action sequence like that. And yeah, Midnight Oil was like with that song, uh, really inspired by like the, the Mississippi blues style of like R.L. Burnside and Junior Kimbrough. And, but yeah, certainly has that like shakedown edge to it. What now, why is Midnight Oil the last song on the record? Cause I think it's actually one of my favorite songs on the record. Like how do you choose the song order? I guess you're probably never going to make everyone happy with it, but. Never going to make everyone happy. And we've changed it so many times. Caleb, <laughs> uh, Caleb, the drummer was really adamant about Midnight Oil being the last song on the album. <laughs> okay. And, uh, we, he, yeah, from, from the jump, he was like, this is the last song it has to be the last song, which is funny because it would actually be a great first song too. Cause it's saying, we're going to burn the midnight oil like with this record. Yeah. But, um, I, I I think it's cool. It, it keeps keep, maybe it will make the listener think that we're keeping the party going. Yeah. Okay. There we're you go. The I, party. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, I think that's going to be a Shazam song. That's just my prediction. I don't uh, know. I, I sure hope it is, man. We've we've uh, been playing it completely different live in a cool way. Like we've taken that arrangement and added to it, and it's it's pretty fun. Okay. Well, I look forward to hear. Hopefully, I can hear that. Um, the song "Good Thing" is that 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 was confusing because it's like you, the lyric is one of these days I'm gonna find my good things or my good thing. And good things come to those who wait. Like, haven't you already found your good thing? Or is this about something else? Or was this like retrospective, like thinking back to when you were younger? Oh, I mean, I have I have so many good good things to be thankful for in my life. Um, but yeah, it's it's. I, I don't know. That's just a feeling that I think everyone can relate to of like kind of like waiting on a train that hadn't showed up yet. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm waiting on this thing that's, that's coming. And I mean, and, and regardless of how many, how many good things that you have, you, you know, it's human nature to want more. I have this good thing. I've got these great friends that I get to make music with. I've got a, a, a wife that I love and get to share, you know, the good times and the bad times with and, and that's, you know, it's all good. I think it's just like, I, especially for me, it's, it's um, thinking like well, selfishly, I'm like thinking about it's going to work. It's going to work for our band. You know, we're going to, we're going to make this happen, you know? And even though we're doing it, you know, 
That's what I was going to say. I mean, you open for ACDC and Guns N' Roses. I mean, so what, you want to, you want a headline? You want them to open for you? Is that the next no, step? No, no, no. Uh, but I mean, I do think that is something that we think about a lot. It's And we're we're saying no to a lot of opening slots at this point. Really? Because, yeah, because I think that it's, I mean, obviously if ACDC called us again, we would we would not say no to them. Um, but it's, it's very important. It, it has been very important for us to keep it in perspective. We are opening for ACDC. We are opening for Guns N' Roses. We're lucky to be here. We'll, we're grateful to be here. But we're essentially the plastic wrap on a CD that these fans have been waiting for. They're waiting to rip us off and get to the main thing as they should be. And so it's and and that's what what like when I think about good thing, it's how do we become the CD that they're waiting for? You know, and and uh keep working towards that, you know, keep working on how do we, uh, how do we sell more tickets in Dubuque, Iowa on Thursday night? You know, how do we get these people here? How do we make it all make sense? And we've been just working, working out the kinks as you do, you know? Mm hmm. Well, that, that's, so that's kind of like that other song, the other new song on the record, sell yourself. If you don't sell yourself, you're going to get sold by someone else. That's, that's directly inspired by, this whole idea that rattle shake records is based upon you know it's sort of like taking ownership of what you do and um you know because that's that's just how the music industry works you know it's how everything works really it's like you you have something that you think is worth sharing then share it otherwise you go do you think it's worth sharing and then they go yes it's worth sharing now i own 75 percent of it because I told you it's worth sharing. So it's just right. sort of us taking ownership in our own thing. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's, it's also think I was thinking a lot about um, Facebook and, you know, social media and how it's like, they're literally taking all of your information and monetizing it, you know? Oh, I want to, I want to reach the audience that his podcast reaches. I could literally go buy your information. That's crazy. It's wild. What a what a world we live in. Yeah, I know. I try not to think about that because I, I I think I would have a panic attack if I think about where all my info. Like, there's basically no privacy in the world anymore. I think we just uncovered what the root of my problem was. <laughs> Seriously, I think everybody's got to be. Do you ever see that movie? What was that movie with Will Smith, where and Gene Hackman, where they like they just trace him everywhere? Like, I. I it's, it's, it's like gives you, it will like give you paranoia. It's crazy, but it's real now. It's like there's cameras everywhere. Our, our yeah. information is everywhere. I mean, unless you just go out, live off the grid in Dubuque, Iowa or something like. You're, yeah. You're... Yeah, I know, man. It's crazy. Um, would you tell me about this when you opened for ACDC? Because they warned you that you might get booed when you went to Europe. Because again, like you said, you're the plastic wrap. Did you guys end up getting booed or did you win over the audiences there? Um. I, I I never heard any booing. Uh, That's good. <laughs> so uh, I, we we had a great time. We had some some just truly spectacular shows. Um, some some moments that I that I will like hopefully like tell a kid about one day that were just mind numbing. Like I remember uh, the first show we did in Europe with them was in Lisbon, Portugal, and it was raining all day, and the crowd was there from like three on. It was like. 60 70 000 people from 3 p.m on and we didn't start till like 6 37 or something so the these people are standing in puddles of water and they're chanting play and they're ch chanting like expletives and you know <laughs> and we're going this is like a pack of wild animals out there they're they are hungry for music and they want acdc and there was also this other tension because that was axel's first show so I think people were kind of still on the fence on if they were going to like it or if they were not going to like it. And uh, when we went out on stage, man, it was like the the clouds literally parted. The sun started shining and it set the tone for that whole tour for us. We ended up just having a great time. You know, obviously some some crowds were harder to get than others. But um, for the most part, we we were able to 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 get a pretty positive reaction, I think. Is that, is that for, yeah, because that's right. Axel was the singer at that point. So he saw you first and then you opened for Guns N' Roses. So is he the one that, that recommended you for to open for Guns N' Roses? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know how much recommendation it took. I think he just kind of said, like, 
Oh yeah, well I mean yeah, so it was his choice though, I guess is what I want to say. Like Yeah, well, I, like we we kept seeing Axel, you know, drive by on like someone would drive him by on a golf cart, you know. It's kind of funny to think about him driving the golf cart, but he, he was <laughs> Yeah. But like he would drive by and give us like a peace sign or like a you know, like one of those we never we never <laughs> got to like talk to him and uh this uh this guy that works for Axel, you know, he he kind of has an entourage around him. He came up to us one day. He's like, he's not going to come talk to you. You got to go talk to him. And we're like, we're not going to go knock on Axel's dressing room. Like, hey, Mr. Rob. Yeah. You know? <laughs> this we'll is not just calling the house of blues. And, uh, and yeah. you know, this is a little different. Yeah. Yeah, no. I mean, we we certainly knew our place. Uh, I do have a funny story about that, though. Like, uh, about the, the first. Uh, uh, I digress. But we met Axel. At, we did two nights at uh, Olympic Stadium in London. And after the first night, Axel, his dressing room door was like kind of cracked open. And one of one of the, his people said, uh, go on in, go on in. So we went in and he was so cool. He was like, man, when I heard you guys in Lisbon, I thought it's so nice to have an opening band. I don't have to fucking ignore. And I was like, that's kind of a cool compliment. <laughs> <laughs> like he well no because i think he probably meant like usually he doesn't care about the opener but he actually cared about you guys yeah and he 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 had mentioned that he liked that it wasn't like just derivative of classic rock and that we were d trying to do our own thing and he thought it was cool and he said i'd love to have you come do some shows with my band <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of them they're called guns and roses like yeah. wow so that's how th that's how that worked and then we ended up doing 29 30 shows with guns you know yeah so what tell me about that experience do you have any interactions with the guns and roses band members at all of course man yeah well we just we just recently did one with them in prague czech republic and you know duff duff came as he was uh walking off stage his security guy was like oh duff, duff these, are, these are uh i think he the security guy said that we were gary clark jr he was like this is gary clark jr and i was like no I, 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 <laughs> um <laughs> but uh and Duff was like, no, no, it's the shakedown. Hey guys, you know, and there was uh like when I first I was really excited to meet Slash because I was gonna I, say because you 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 guys have some similarities in guitar sound. Is that on is that are you influenced by him or I you guys have the Slash, same influences? Man. I yeah. love Slash. He's he's been a huge uh huge influence on me. And uh the first time I met him was in Cincinnati, Ohio, which was at our first show of guns. And he told he told us that he had our EP in his car. And I was like, oh, wow. that's so cool. And um, they they were just so kind to us. They treated us great. Everyone on their team and crew was so kind. You know, you hear you hear all these stories about guns, like from the heyday where they're crazy and hard to work with. They were just so nice. And, uh, dude, they even in South America, they let us fly on their private jet with them. Whoa, that must have been amazing. I don't know if the band knew that we were going to be on the plane, uh, but, the, but the, you know, the, they're kind of crew crew guys are like it's okay because we were we had to get with some crazy travel mm. and uh we got on the plane before they did and we immediately went to the back so we were like they'll sit up front and they won't even know we're here we we're kind of like stowaways and uh, <laughs> stowaways on a private jet i love it it wasn't i mean it was like a full-on like 737 though it wasn't like a small plane it was okay like, you could fit 250 300 people on this plane you know damn is that where they take for every show or just certain yeah, dude, it's it's the full like whatever the big commercial jet is that's what they have and so we go to the back order some red wine and filet mignon you know and <laughs> sitting back there eating steak drinking wine and then I, I remember duff came and he was going to the bathroom and he walked back and was like what the hell are you guys doing here who let these guys on and we we all had a good laugh so wait, he was joking. He wasn't really mad though. Right? Yeah, no, he was. Like, he didn't make us like parachute out or anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome! Wow, yeah, that's... We, sure, we sure got a kick out of it, though. I tell you that much. Yeah, that's a cool story. Damn. Okay. So, so, but you're kind of tired of doing being an opening band. So you, now you want to be a headlining. What about like a co-headlining tour or like a a package deal? Like I thought you and Kenny Wayne Shepherd that would be a cool show. I would see that. That would be great, you know. I mean, but Kenny's Kenny's uh he's he's bigger than we are, so we would we would have to be support. And I think the thing that we're we it, it has nothing to do with not liking 
supporting artists who are more successful. That's a great thing. It's it's not getting to play long enough. We don't want to play 30 minute sets. We don't want to play 40 minute sets because it's not fair to our fans to keep who, who the people who are having to pay more money for a concert ticket than they would if they were just coming to see us to only mm -hmm. get 30 minutes to come see us. You know, I'm sure sure if we're opening for Guns or ACDC, they're getting a great experience, you know. Um and if we were opening for Kenny, they would get a great experience. But the goal I feel is like, yeah, because I feel like with Kenny, he'd give you more than 30. I feel like that. I mean, yeah, he's probably yeah. going to be the headliner, but you could still do like an hour and then he does an hour and a half or something. Yeah, I feel like no, and be... he's, he's a homie, dude. I mean, he's he's a friend oh, really? of mine. And, and, you know, I mean, that would be it'd be great to do do shows with him. I think for us, it's just we've we've do, we've been building it as a support act so long that we have we have to put our focus into headlining and and we're trying to be strategic about it we're i mean we're basically starting at clubs again you know and and going and trying to 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 build up you know our audience in clubs so then we can hopefully move up to small theaters and you know it's it's different for us in Europe than it is in America it's we we hmm. we sell more tickets in Europe you know we can sell you know, we last time we played Paris, France, we sold more tickets on a Monday night than we've pre-sold for our album release show in Nashville. So it's just really interesting. it's interesting to see how how it changes. I mean, we've sold a, a a a decent amount of tickets for our album release show in Nashville, but it's it's just worked better over there. And it's we're gonna we're just gonna keep building it here in America and as well as in Europe, you know? And um and I want to go back to South America and do our own shows there because we had some of the best shows we've ever had with Guns. We got to do one with Def Leppard there, Alice Cooper. We played with The Who, Aerosmith, all in like one week across South America. We did wow. all of these great shows. And now if you go look at those rock and roll metrics that we were speaking about, it's one of our largest audiences across all streaming platforms. Like hmm. Brazil loves the shakedown and we love brazil so it's like we got to go back there we got to go build it there um and so it's just been a matter of like how do we do this how do we keep scaling this and also do it do it smart like at this point i'm proud that we own all of our own equipment in europe like you don't think about that sort of thing we've got it there so it's hmm. one huge less expense where we can go over there more often more freely and work oh that's interesting so what you have like in storage or something yeah Oh, that's smart. Yeah, because I always hear that's part of the problem with bands going overseas. It's too expensive to bring all the equipment. So then they yeah, just don't even do it. Yeah. It's so it's so hard to, uh, especially at the level that we're at, to, to do it and make money, you know, and, yeah. and and it's hard. And that's that's something that's that's hard to sustain for people, you know, because it takes money to live. So we've we've luckily had these great opportunities to where it's like, cool, let's take some of what we were going to make opening for ACDC or whatever. and then buy some stuff and now it's now it's here and that's one less thing we have to buy next time okay now now put now we got more of this that we needed now it's there and and trying to i, I think the goal is to just have that kind of infrastructure wherever we go i mean obviously we'll, we'll carry our stuff in in the states but just trying to figure out ways to to be able to do this for as long as i can that's gotcha my, that's my goal yeah. So now, because I think I looked on the website and there's like, a, there was a couple shows lined up for September and October. There's the music festival. You got the Monsters of Rock cruise. Will, will uh, more shows be added then, I'm assuming? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We're, yeah. We're, um, we're adding some more shows for this year and then we're adding a ton of shows for next year. So there, there will be a lot of dates announced very soon. Okay. I can't wait. Hopefully I can catch a show. I'm in Phoenix. So I, as long oh, as I great. drive for shows. Yeah. So. Yeah, We'll yeah, definitely, that'd be, definitely hit Phoenix. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we got a lot of good venues here. But like I said, sometimes like I'll drive to Vegas or something if it's a show. If it's a you know, like you're, I've never. I I'm trying to remember. Did you guys open for Guns when I I saw them in Phoenix a couple of years, like 2019 or something? I can't remember yeah, if that was you guys uh, open. It was us and Zach Wild on that show. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. And you did a tour with Zach Wild as well, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, we played Phoenix with him a few times, I think. Yeah. That's very cool. I always wondered this too. I was going to ask you about like, why did you choose to name the band that the way that you did? Cause there's a lot of bands that are basically like kind of one guy and like, you know, Foo Fighters is basically Dave Grohl. Right. So did you, did you ever consider just naming it a band or um, did you, I mean, cause I kind of like too, that it's, 
it's Tyler Bryant because that is you are the front man of the band. You're the singer and the guitarist. So it makes sense. But I just wondered if you thought of a band name at ever. Well, it, it originally started out as the Tyler Bryant band, which, you know, that was a really it was an inventive name that we struggled over for a long time. <laughs> and, um, it just it, I, I think originally I wanted to be a solo artist. And then I met Caleb and Graham and we had, we had been touring under the Tyler Bryant project whatever and mm -hmm. it was like we need a band name so we just added the shakedown we didn't we didn't put all that much thought into if it should just be a band or what it seemed natural at the time there have, there have been times over the years where i'm like man let's just call it the shakedown yeah i mean that's how we refer to it you know when we're talking about it anyways but we are uh you know i i, I look at it as a even partnership with those dudes you know we've been through a lot together and we starve together and we feast together. So I consider it a, a real old good fashion rock band, you know? Awesome. Yeah, I love it. Very cool. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I always end each episode uh, trying to promote a charity. Is there a charity that's near and dear to your heart you want to give a shout out to here? Uh, man, I'll just I'll shout out St. Jude, man. I I, uh, I think it's awesome what they're doing and, you know, sucks to see kids needing help, you know, so. Absolutely. Well, I've, yeah, I've promoted them many, many times. I'll put the link in the show notes along with your website. And uh, can people, can they pre-order the album? Yeah, they can pre-order the album. Yeah. We've, got yeah. these, we've got these awesome creamsicle colored vinyl. Oh. Uh, so yeah, get one of those before they're gone. And then um, you can pre-save, uh, pre-order CDs, all that stuff as well. Okay, follow you on social media, all the good stuff. So very, yeah. very cool. Thank you so much, Tyler. It's been a blast. Uh, I look forward to seeing you live. Hey, man, thanks for taking the time. Great chatting with you. Okay, you too. Take it easy. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you again to Tyler Bryant. Make sure to check out the new record, Shake the Roots. It's out September 9th, or it's available for pre-order now. Or it may be available now, depending on when you're listening to this episode. Uh, his website is in the show notes, so check that for current tour dates. Or follow him on social media. And while you're on there, you can give me or the show a follow on social media. And if you haven't uh, done so yet... Please make sure to subscribe wherever you listen. It's very important. I appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day. And remember to shoot for the moon.